the time. Uh, I asked Doug if I could come and just kind of substitute uh, for him for this particular track that he's going to do mine, uh, because I really wanted to introduce this next speaker. Uh, the next speaker, uh, I had the privilege of working with this uh, uh, with this gentleman uh, as a uh, co-worker, uh, as a subordinate, uh, as a good friend, and uh, uh, as, as uh, uh, a rep from a company servicing his account. So it was, uh, it's been sort of a unique relationship, I'd say. Wouldn't you, Tim? I would say so, yes. Over the years. So, uh, it's, uh, Tim has a wide breadth of experience uh, dating back uh, to when I was in high school, so that's been a while. And, and uh, really has a lot of good knowledge to share. So really excited for you guys to hear this talk because I've, I've seen different, definitely seen different pieces of this uh, and been looking forward to this for a few months. So without further ado, I think you Tim Carter's. Thank you. So we're having some, uh, some video problems all the second. We should get those solved in a second. But we did that going on. I'll give a little bit of background on this talk. This talk is not necessarily truly blue talk. Um, I think Phil put me in the blue because I am definitely a, a blue guy. Um, if you heard Ed's talk this morning, I'm kind of his polar opposite in many respects. Instead of hack all the things, my goal is to detect all the things, right? And a key part of that is understanding what the adversaries do, right? Not at a hypothetical level, oh, I think they do this, right? One of the interesting things, as Phil mentioned, we had the opportunity to work together for a while. Um, that was at Mandia. And for me, as a longtime practitioner, what was really interesting was getting to see what's going on really in the breaches, because what comes out in the media is not actually, you know, there's bits and pieces of facts, but not really totally accurate, right? And so one of the failures that I see commonly in our space as blue is we fall into this trap, I think, right, we go to Sands, and see this great train, you know, that, please be clear, I'm not talking to Sands train, right, on how do we pen test and all that kind of stuff. And then we as defenders fall into this trap of, oh, well, the bad guys are all using Metasploit, the bad guys are using MNAP, and et cetera, right? Not that there aren't bad guys who do, but those aren't the ones that are responsible for all these big breaches that are going on, right? Literally, in a lot of these cases, it is absolutely not that we can't detect these guys. We can. The issue is just that we as good guys, defenders, are looking over here, and the bad guys are just simply over here, right? And so to combat that, a number of years ago, what I started doing, let me see, you know, this is back here to help you guys. Yeah. So the technical problems have got in here. They don't want me to show you how to get in basis. Is this Adrian Cox? Yeah. Adapter? Does he have a Thunderbolt? Please, HDMI adapter in there? Alright, fingers. Hmm. It's not working. 
and nobody wants that. So at the end of the day, our kind of holy grail, as it were, from my perspective, is if I can take specific adversaries, understand them so well that I can create detection that is unevadable, I win, right? Because they have no opportunity then to harm us without us knowing immediately that they're present so that we can boot them out before they complete the mission, right? So that's ultimately the goal. Now, this is a really dangerous area that we're trading here, and I, I'd be remiss not to put this out here, right? Because what we're doing in this is we're interacting directly with criminals' systems. You need to think really carefully before you take that step, right? What we're doing uh, is not illegal, right? We're not hacking into anything, we're not, we're not buffer overflowing anything, nothing like that. You'll see in just a minute here, right? But you are interacting with them. If they have good OPSEC, right, operational security, they potentially will find you. That's not necessarily a good thing, right? If you're infiltrating a DDoS botnet and they find you, guess what's coming your way? A DDoS, right? Uh, and especially if you get into some of the nation state stuff. So there's lots of precautions that you want to take, okay? So we're gonna do this literally live. I'm gonna spin up a new C2 injection here because why not? I like poking fun at the bad guys. So um, uh, I really do consider those companies. And, uh, uh, but when I do this, I'm tunneled out of my laptop to a burn, burner hosted server, right? From that burner hosted server, right, I'm connecting through, so I've got multiple layers, uh, really, really tight, you know, I could set, I could table rules, et cetera. None of that, though, ultimately prevents them from getting back to us and figuring out who they are. So this isn't something you want to enter into like that. The other thing you want to be aware of is there are government agencies and intelligence firms that are doing work on these groups as well. So you also have some potential here to burn some existing operations, okay? So you want to think really hard about that. And ultimately, as the slide says, right, doing good operational security so that you can't get found is hard, okay? Unfortunately, we can't cover how to do all of that in an hour. Um, again, that's why I've chosen something very simple that's fairly, fairly low risk. So let's just make sure everybody's on the same page on what we're talking about with C2. C2 is command and control server, right? And the whole idea with C2 is it gives an asynchronous command, right? So I love all of the, the, uh, the stuff in the media that comes out where people are going, oh, well, that's not China, or that's not Russia, or that's not whatever source, just because those addresses. They're not connecting from their original source to the endpoints, right? They're connecting to middle layers, command and control layers. Those are what your backdoors, your apps, your bots, et cetera, are communicating with, right? And of course, we have tons of protocols. IRC was the, the first protocol for most of this stuff, uh, just a really easy protocol. We still see IRC used, mostly now in the droid malware, right? So I haven't seen a lot of new malware for PCs that uses IRC for comms, but for whatever, uh, we're seeing tons and tons of droid malware that's using IRC for its command and control infrastructure. So certainly still exists. Any of these can be leveraged for the communications, right? Um, so pretty straightforward there. And then ultimately, we really have two broad flavors uh, things that we're dealing with. One is what we call bots, which is just serve for robots. The point of bots is to have a one-to-many communications, right? With bots, you've got one controller that wants to be able to control a complete, you know, army of bots, right? Potentially into the millions. Whereas RAPs, remote access Trojans, which also can be uh, infiltrated, command and control for those as well, um, those have a one-to-one -one typically, right? And so that looks out something like this. So this particular one's IRC, but it could as well be any other protocol 
right? It's simply a mechanism where you have all of the different uh, victim PCs, right, with the malicious software running on them, connecting into the to the overall central architecture. Okay, pretty straightforward. Bad guy also logs in, issues his commands, sends it out. So the one we're dealing with today, although it doesn't use IRC, it uses a uh, uh, just a, a open protocol. It's very HTTP like. Um, but it's not HTTP, it's kind of a custom protocol. Uh, but the effect is very IRC like, as you'll see here um, shortly. And then uh, the RAS, typically, uh, at least the, the medium scale ones and up, actually have two levels of C2 servers that you'll have to deal with, sometimes even three. So we have what we typically call a parking server, right? And that's where the beacons are going to. So you get a RAN installed on a host, it'll connect out every, say, five minutes or one hour or whatever the beacon interval is for that. It can be typically very custom. An hour is a pretty common one. And what's going on there is the RAN's going out to the stage one C2 server, right? And it's just going, hey, you got anything for me? And if so, then it switches typically to a stage two server. Now that may involve downloading an additional piece of code into the host, maybe part of the core functionality. Again, it all just depends. But the stage two C2 server is where the bad guys can interact directly with the host. So now is where he's typing commands, or she is typing commands, and the back door in that victim machine is executing those commands. Okay? And again, we need to understand those uh, differences because, of course, that plays out in how we do it. So the process for going about this all is pretty straightforward. Obviously, we need our hands on the malware, right? Uh, I'm going to show you the technique for that here in a second. Then we've got to reverse engineer the protocol. We've got to figure out what's the protocol being used. Now, even if they're using a standard protocol, like, say, IRC or HTTP, We've got to know things like what are the commands? What are the responses that the box is going to send back? Because what we're doing here effectively is we're building a fake bot, right? So I'm building a bot that looks to the server like it's just any old bot, but it's not. Now, some people will do things like take the malware and neuter it, right? You'll, you'll drop, say, the, the attack mechanisms that are in that bot. I prefer just to write a complete thing from scratch to mimic the bot because it's much safer, right? There could be things in that code that I'm not aware of, and again, we're dealing with live criminals here. I really don't want any of this stuff escaping, right? My tool of choice is Python. It could be whatever language that you prefer when you do that. So in particular, we need to determine those four key things. Is there encryption occurring? Okay, uh, in the communications protocol, is there some sort of authentication mechanism that's taking place? You've got to understand that. Uh, what are the commands to the bot and what are the responses from the bot? So those are really the four key things that you've got to figure out. Once you've got that done, then you just simply prototype it in our language, figure out where the C2 servers are, and the infiltrate. Right? Fairly straightforward. Tools, of course, are the standard tools we use in any malware analysis. In particular here, though, Wireshark is going to be your best friend, right? So the way I usually go about this is I will set up on one of my burner servers out on the internet, say maybe something running on AWS, right? Run the malware with Wireshark going, right? TCP dump, whatever. Capture the communications going back and forth between the bot and the C2. So you're doing live here at this point, right? Most of the time, that's all you need, right? You let it run for a while, put some maybe some, I would really recommend if you take that route, put some restrictions about what that bot can do, right? So when I do that, for instance, I'll drop in some IP tables rules, so literally that bot can only come back and forth to that C2 server that I've uh, determine that it comes to, right? So definitely you need to, again, think about some precautions on what you're doing here. Uh, of course, we can break out IPro, et cetera, uh, and do that. But again, let's start with a real one here. So most of this today, I want to focus on doing this for real. 
So one of the things that I mentioned to start with, let's make this a little bigger here. So I'm fortunate enough to have a virus total intelligence subscription. Highly, highly recommend it. So in this case, notice one of my malware analysts wrote this nice little yard rule set for me. So as you saw with, with what Paul was doing with Viper in the last talk, right? Uh, Yara is tremendously useful for a lot of this stuff. So this is a specific Yara signature looking for the gap hit pot, right? So we run this, and literally we will do some live here again. So I go over here to notifications. So the way virus total intelligence works, you can upload by, uh, uh, Yara rules, and then it goes out and runs it. And this is live. I mean, this isn't made up here. So notice our date and time, and actually we just got a new GAF kit, which, so notice I've got lots of ER signatures looking for stuff here. So we go out here to our particular sample. Uh, this one just came in hot, because literally I was just checking to make sure everything was working. And in this case, I'm just going to go out to the strings here, um, because, Let's see if we've got, GAF gets really nice because frankly, uh, it's, it's about as simple as it gets. And notice here, here's our C2 server and port. Okay? So in a few minutes, we'll try that. Since it's a new sample, it's probably live. Now in this case, just to make things easy, uh, now unfortunately it wasn't available when I initially uh, wrote this particular uh, bot, uh, emulate bot, rather. Um, but in March of this year, somebody leaked the actual gap in source code. So I'm running that in a separate VM. I'll show that here in a second. Uh, but let's talk about figuring out those commands and stuff, right? So in this case, right, I just Googled gap hit this afternoon here a few minutes ago. Notice I've got some really good write-ups on what this is doing. So here's an actual sample of the traffic going back and forth. Notice the pings and the palms, okay? Almost all back doors have some sort of an evil live mechanism, okay? And so that's what we're seeing with the palms and pings there. So on a particular interval, in Gapkit's case, every 30 seconds, it sends a ping to the server, and the server sends a pong back. At the same time, on the server side, the server is sending pings down to the back door, and the back door is expected to respond with the pong. So that's why you'll notice multiple. The commands in GAPGIT are all preceded with the exclamation asterisk. So exclamation asterisk scanner on is a command that tells GAPGIT to, uh, to start sweeping a random set of IP addresses, and it's using the, uh, the good old, I um, uh, just blanked on that, shell shock, right? So this was one of the early shell shock uh, pieces of malware. And so literally, it runs shell shock. It also does some really simple brute forcing. So it scans for open port 22. Um, yeah, there it shows. Here, let me make this a little bigger. So notice, it sweeps for port 22. If it finds an open telnet, it tries to log in with those password, user password combinations, right? So really simple scanning. If then it succeeds in doing that, it then just simply executes a command. So in this case, notice there's this busy box, uh, echo dash g, so on and so forth. That's actually a technique for detecting honeypots, right? What it's doing is trying to make sure that what it's trying to exploit and log into is not a honeypot. If it doesn't get the expected response, it just drops, right? Uh, and most honeypots will respond incorrectly to this particular command. So it's just a really simple technique for honeypot addition, right? If it works, then it just simply runs some command to download now, in the Lizard Squad's case, and part of the reason why they were able to get such a large botnet so quick, 
the vast majority of their bots were our FIBO boxes. So the vast majority of our, our, our good old folks providing us with those nice embedded Linux FIBOs uh, have really simple password combinations and also were all susceptible to shell shock and allowed them to, uh, at one point they were well over uh, several million uh, TiVos that were running inside uh, Lizard Squad's botnet. And that's what they were using to execute all of these uh, denial of service attacks from. So you have may have been helping them and didn't even know it. Um, and then here we've got an example of the commands that are in there, right? So we've got the ping command, we've got the shell command, we've got local IP, it's pretty obvious in terms of response, scanner on and off, uh, pretty straightforward. We've got jump, UDP, and TCP play, okay? And it's just the command, the target IP, target port, how many seconds, then there's some few other optional parameters you can supply. Uh, kill attack will kill the, uh, the flood, hold will also stop the flooding, and then the LOL no, GTFO, I'm sure you can figure out what that means, um, is actually used in two cases. Uh, the server itself has a protection mechanism, so if two bots from the same IP address log into the, the C2, it will execute that command and uh, terminate all of the bots. Uh, it can also, of course, be uh, typed in manually and uh, cause the bots to, uh, to terminate. Now, that doesn't remove them, however, so the next time they're still persistent, so the next time that system is rebooted, they'll uh, reconnect back into C2. So that's giving us a really good feel for what our, uh, our traffic looks like, right? Um, again, I've got other, other uh, articles, and literally, Gafget, and that's part of why I chose it here today, is so simple that in most cases, we can just uh, literally not even have to break open IDAPRO in this case. Uh, when I wrote this one initially, I did use IDAPRO because all of these uh, weren't done, but at this point in time, it is absolutely not necessary. So what I've got here in this system is uh, the actual Gafget, oops, wrong screen there, the actual Gafget server running, okay? So uh, in the lower right-hand window, this is the server itself, the C2 server. Uh, literally, I just compiled this from the lead source code um, and executed it, pretty straightforward. In the left window, you can see I've just commented into the C2 server's control port, and that's the, I'm, I'm emulating the bad guy from that side, okay? And then, last but not least, I've got here the actual source code, or the, uh, my bot source code that I've got, that I've written. And why is it not increasing my font size? I guess that's kind of readable, okay? So now I've written this, I, I rewrote this uh, to try and be a little modular and a little uh, easy to do. Uh, made, try to make it really simple Python code here, not doing anything fancy. Uh, really the only tricky bit with writing a lot of these is you've got to set up some sort of a timer function for the, for the keep alive, right? And so, in this case, I've got my initial header stuff, right? I'm just setting up some, some variables here that I'll use. So the IP address is the C2 server, the buffer size I want to use to communicate. 99 times out of 100, you just need to set the C2 address and, and the uh, C2 port, right? Now, I've also got notice bot name and bot pass. That's for bots that use authentication, yeah, it does not. So in this case, I don't actually even use them. Then I've got a bot responses little thing set up here, which I've only got one set up, and that's because I create static responses for most of the things that I want to supply information. So in this case, when it gets the command get local IP, I always just respond 192.168.1.42, 
right? I know that's a common RFC 1918 address, that a lot of these infected systems are going to be sitting behind some side of the firewall. It gives no real address, but yet it also doesn't show the outside address of where I'm coming from, right? And so it just makes it easy to look like, yep, this is just a vulnerable box that's sitting inside a network somewhere that's communicating out. Obviously, if you do use the source code, change that address to something else, just so you know they find the code. Then I've just got a couple blocks here that are setting up the, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, I've got one that just does reverse lookup for the target ID, so I've got a name. Then these blocks are really where the bulk of the work is done, okay? So in this case, notice I'm just supporting the different commands. So I've got my keep alive function, Right, so the keep alive function is just simply looking for that that ping, right, and responding, or I mean, it's sending that ping that's expected every 30 seconds, rather. I've also got a couple functions that I'm not using here. I call it xmint garble and xmint ungarble. Those are the sub functions I use if there's encryption going on, right? So again, I'll just feed it into the function decrypt it, feed it into the function encrypt it, so I can support whatever encryption that they're employing. Then I've got my ping response function, my UDP response function, TCP flood, junk flood, and then support for the log off. Now you'll notice there's a number of things I'm doing, because remember, my goal in doing this is I want intel. What I'm trying to do is determine what is it that the adversary is using this for, right? So notice all of these functions are transmitting whatever is expected, and then I'm writing it out to a log with a date and time stamp, right? In this case, I literally just call it bot.log, and so I write that data out there with the date and time, and notice things like UDP flood, in this case, target one is the actual IP address being targeted, Target two is the port, target three is the duration. Okay, not too, too complex. Uh, again, obviously we don't quite have time to cover, you know, teach Python per se, uh, but it, it's not too terribly difficult. And then finally we have the loop, or the, the main function for the bot. Notice here I've got just opening up my, my file, opening up my socket, and then these patterns here, again, are not used with Kafka. What you'll get, though, with a lot of the, especially the one-to-many bots, is they'll have a capability to individually address bots. And so what that's a setup for is those kind of bots, because what you want to do is those sorts of bots will authenticate to the server. You need to look for the bot's name being addressed. So you know that that command is aimed at that bot. But the one to many that have individual addressing like that, so Gaffey is not that smart, any command type goes to all bots, all bots executed. It's just that simple and dumb, frankly, right? But if it's individually addressed, you've got to make sure your bot recognizes, oh, I got a command so that it can respond accordingly. So I'm just using a regex there to look for the bot name in the incoming. Again, not used in this particular one. Again, I've also got the, the authentication section commented out in this case because we don't need it for this bot. And then when we initially come in, we're expected to identify ourselves. So in this case, the way Gapit works is it just sends a simple string saying, hey, this is my operating system. Again, I'm just sending completely bogus crap. <laughs> right? I put the current date and time in there so that it's current as expected by the C2 server, but I'm just telling it that I'm on i686 Athlon running new Linux, right? Completely irrelevant. They have no way of validating that data, so, you know, I want to pick something that's very generic to try and blend in, right? Um, and that's something that you can look for when you're doing the actual uh, you know, kind of set up a cell. And then otherwise, it's literally just, I take in the, 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 you know, data coming from the C2 server, and then I just simply look and see, oh, is this one of my canned bot responses where I want to send it a specific just canned response, or is it something that I need to send it specific? 
And in that case, I called the appropriate function for the command that came in, right? Pretty straightforward. And I've tried to make this really easily extensible. So if you want to do this, right, just replace those functions with the appropriate ones and the appropriate responses up in those functions. Uh, so fairly, hopefully, simple uh, to use. And then the last thing is I just put in a keyboard interrupt uh, to detect it. So let's try it. So this one, I'm just going to run here locally, right? So the uh, IP address and port here just connect to that virtual machine. So I'm just going to execute this. And so you'll notice there, again, I didn't write the server, so hose connected one. That's my fake bot just connected to the channel, right? The pin connected, of course, is because I'm logged in as the server. So now I can issue commands to the bot, right? So I can say, all right, so, you know, give me your uh, local IP. Get local IP of a detector today, right? And if you notice over here, we got a response from the bot. My IP is that 192.168.1.42. Notice, by the way, here was that initial sign-in string, right? In terms of the uh, identification on what sort of Linux that I'm running, okay? Notice there came a Pong, that's that 30 second uh, uh, just automated mechanism, right? And of course I can tell it, all right, uh, let's UDP flood, um, I'll go for Evil Corp here, we'll flood their DNS server for 500 seconds, okay? And notice the bot responded, UDP flooding 3232.53 for 500 seconds. Right? Simple as that. Nothing too fancy, no rocket science here. Um, but what's nice about this is then we get logs of all this activity. And some of these guys are really, mm, geniuses isn't the right word. You know, so uh, just over the last week while I was tuning up this code, I've been running the, this bot in three different just new gadgets. So two servers that I saw spring up in the, in the, in the uh, uh, virus soap stuff. And uh, some real brain, I mean, clearly rocket science material, uh, has been trying to sin flood the UDP. I suspect that's not working out very well for it. Probably needs some basic protocol uh, instructions, but not my problem. So, let me tell the bot to get off. All right, bot got off. All right, so let's do this for real, though, because that's a lot more fun. All right, so you guys saw me pull this up here, right? So this is virus total, just came up a few minutes ago. So let's copy that server over, and I should have a shell here somewhere. So let's make a directory. So typically the way I do this, oh, I made it when I was testing earlier. Uh, let's pull a different one. That's, that's a new one from the existing one. Let's see if we can get, I've already been monitoring that guy. Let's take another gasket sample. Here's another gasket sample. Again, we'll just open it up. Content, strings, because this is a really sophisticated backdoor. Yeah, there we go. This was a different C2. I'm going to copy my uh, generic bot down in. We need to edit it. Change our C2 server. All right, that's our C2 server, port 921. Now let's run. Most of the gap gets served, and we're in. Just as simple as that. 
So we're now live monitoring a new, very real C2 server out on the interwebs. Uh, I have no idea who this is. Again, just popped up on our social today. Um, you notice the initial command, and that's an automated command. As soon as the, the back door connects, it just turns around and immediately says, turn the scan on, right? Start sweeping for hosts, try logging in on Telnet on port 22 using those, and notice our, our keep alive start rolling. And so now it's just a matter of the leader run, right? Um, and let it collect and teleport. And that's literally um, all there is to this um, in terms of it. Now, I want to be clear, this is definitely one of the simplest ones, uh, which of course is why I chose it, because I wanted something that we could uh, cover in the, you know, in the time we have today. But, but that's really all there is to the process, right? It's just that figuring out what that protocol is so you can emulate this malicious software and win, right? And uh, what I can tell you from having done this now for five or six years with probably at this point thousands of C2 servers and infrastructures is that the adversaries are not doing what you think they're doing. Um, you know, it's not rocket science, but in most cases it is very different than what you think they're doing. So if you go out to GitHub, you can get a copy of the, uh, the code uh, that I've got. Use it at your own risk and not responsible for you getting DDoS or anything like that, which is clear in the MIT license I put on it. Um, <laughs> this is, again, uh, be very careful with going into this. And of course, there's lots of other things we can do with this. Uh, like I said, uh, you know, adding the ability to uh, you know, text you if it's something interesting goes on, right? Uh, but otherwise, it's then just collecting these logs and, and analyzing it. It's kind of a reverse honeypot, as it were, right? Rather than us waiting for them to come to, up to uh, us, we go up to them. And, um, yeah, in my opinion, it's a lot more. So, questions? Sir? How do, you, how do you deal with, or have you run into, communication with the C2s, like the interactive ones, like SSH? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, great question. Yeah. So, yeah. what happens if they drop a shell, for instance? You know, the Gafkit does support a shell command. I just respond uh, with an error message. <laughs> right? I pretend that the bot shell is not working because that happens in the real world. It has burned you. And that particular thing has burned me a few times, but not too often. Yeah. yeah. Most of them will go, oh, there's something wrong with that implementation. They'll just move on to the next bot. I have burned C2s. There is no question I have been found uh, over the years, right? Uh, but I'll be honest, it's rare. Probably. One in 500, maybe, right? Um, most of these guys are have no operational security. You know, typically there's hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of these bots in these channel, and it's really easy to go unnoticed. Uh, but the biggest trick is trying to make sure up front that you really closely emulate what they're expecting going back to that C2 server. Sir? Well, yeah, so his question was, what's the difference between working with commodity and nation state? Nation state has more resources and better operational security, right? So with nation states, they actually check their logs. With nation states, they won't immediately let on that they figured out that you're in their, uh, in their base, as it were. Um, so your operational security is even more important, uh, quite frankly. So, you know, it's, it's a really good idea to put multiple, multiple layers of, of things between you. Um, but that said, I'm, I, I don't think I'm so smart that I'm probably not on some lists. It's, it, it is what it is. Uh, probably don't want to think about traveling to some of those countries, perhaps. Sir? So, this is kind of useful to say, okay, 
uh, Boone inspired and paid to use my IPs that I care about. Yeah. So what other things can we use kind of operationally with this information? Well, so this particular bot, there's not a ton, right? It's just in the dust bot. But the bots that are much more sophisticated, where they can do a much greater range of things, then you get a lot of things like TTPs potentially, especially the one to ones, right? So the, the large botnet herds, those aren't, frankly, for what most of us as defenders are caring about, that big of a deal because they're mostly sending spam, you know, doing drive-by installs, things like that. Now that's useful, but that's useful mostly for intel purposes and, and attribution, right? Where it gets interesting for us as defenders, right, are when you get things like, you know, the, the, the snippet that I showed earlier, right? So, like I said, this is anonymized for real logs, right? So here you're actually seeing everything they're typing, right? This gives you invaluable amounts of data on, you know, things like what directories are they using, what are their tools, what's there, so on and so forth, right? Which allows you then to craft really tight. Uh, I've got a dangerous question. So say you found this inside your environment. Yes. Do you ever go and replace their bot with your code? I, I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, leave it up to you <laughs> to decide. Is that something you can do? It certainly is something you can do. Yes. Sir? Know that uh, there are other agencies in the agency that are out there doing yeah. the same thing. They're taking the same bikes out of 50 or 10 or 18 or whatever. Yeah. You're working independent. Yes. Now, since you're working independent, you can potentially be permanent, like you indicated. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so short answer, just because we're almost out of time. Yes. Right. So, uh, I have clearances. I, I work with several three letter agencies. You know, uh, pass the logs along is appropriate. Right. So, like, let's say I find in a C two server and I see somebody attacking something that I think you know my friends at the bureau would care about, and I will pass those logs to them. Right. Um, the key, though, from my perspective is my risk personally of burning operations is very, very low, specifically because I don't take any active money. I am purely taking a passive listing, right? So in my case, I don't act on any of this data directly. You know, I'm certainly not going after them, et cetera. Um, so because of that, my, my likelihood, I'm not publishing papers on what I'm finding, that sort of thing, while it's tempting, um, that's what gets operations burned, right? So the easiest way for you to burn uh, um, Intel op is to publish data on what's going on in a particular C2, like a blog post or something like that, which then tips the bad guys off that they're being monitored if the, the other good guys, agency type good guys, are also then, then they potentially so that's the, and that's the main reason I don't do that, uh, specifically. But I mentioned that one specifically so people are cognizant of the nature, right? McAfee did that with a big post they did a number of years ago, completely burned an infrastructure down um, that really hurt a lot of intel agencies and private folks monitoring. So I think there was one more question. Yes, sir. Um, you said something about what we think it is, what it really is. Yeah. Yeah, so I think this would be a good example of that, right? So this happens to be um, a group that Mandy calls APT1, right? Their MO is very simple. They don't, for instance, ever use NMAP and tools like that, right? They dump their list via Active Directory. That group, quote, domain admins, quote, slash domain, stuff like that, right? Um, they're dropping these tools. This NetView, for instance, is a tool that shows authenticated um, sessions. So they dump the local password cache, use it on the authenticated sessions, which of course is what the passwords are good for, rinse and repeat until they find a host that's got an admin account, 
get the hash, right? Um, just simple things like that that are just not the typical way you think the actors are operating, right? Um, and so then understanding that better then allows you better to do the hash. All right, so I think we're out of time. Uh, we have some giveaways. Three giveaways, it looks like.